Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. This is based on a presentation from RSNA 2022 on the typical and atypical appearances of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, the role of CTA and cinematic rendering, and a special emphasis is really placed on cinematic rendering. Now, what are neuroendocrine tumors, or peanuts? They're well-differentiated endocrine cell tumors. All are hormonally active, but we need to be careful because they're all hormonally active, but then we divide them into hyperfunctioning and non-hyperfunctioning. So they're all functioning, but when they're non-hyperfunctioning, they're not causing any specific symptoms. Typical things for hyperfunctioning, insulinomas, gastrinomas, glucagonomas, VIPomas, and somatostinomas. The functioning ones tend to be detected earlier and smaller uh, when the patients are symptomatic. Uh, we do have syndromic associations with von Hippel-Lindau, neurofibromatosis type 1, MEN1, and tuberous sclerosis. And this image on the page here is just a nice example of a large mass vascular in the head of the pancreas and a large secondary component or, or nodal component to the left of midline. Now, when you speak about neuroendocrine tumors, you recognize that they do have a variable appearance. Shape and size, they're typically well circumscribed, but they can be a centimeter or 10 centimeters. They're typically solid. However, they can be purely cystic or solid and cystic with areas of necrosis. Although they're typically hypervascular, sometimes they can be mildly hypervascular, but even hypovascular. In terms of vascular involvement, they typically invade venous vasculature rather than encasing and narrowing them as you would see with adenocarcinoma. You get a crescent sign as the tumor grows directly into the vein and common areas of involvement are portal vein or SMV. When we talk about pancreatic masses that calcify, these can and commonly do and typically they're central and can be bulky. When you talk about metastasis, the Mets are typically hypervascular, and the area of greatest concern typically is the liver, but also local lymph nodes. Lymph nodes can be hypervascular presentation, but hypovascular after therapy. In terms of ductal involvement, it's rare, but if a tumor is large, or neuroendocrine tumors that secrete serotonin and are small, but lead to ductal fibrosis and obstruction can be causing pancreatic duct obstruction. We'll show some examples of these serotonin type tumors because they're very interesting. You may only see the pancreatic duct dilated and you think you're dealing with a carcinoma unless that lesion enhances. Uh, otherwise, it can be a real challenge. When you talk about the differential diagnosis, of neuroendocrine tumors, it always makes you think of adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma typically poorly marginated, but can be better marginated when they're small. They're hypovascular, they encase vessels both on the arterial and venous side. They never calcify. You can see calcification in pancreatic cancer if it arises in a zone of chronic pancreatitis. Enlarged lymph nodes are not rare, uh, but most nodes are going to be small, and METs to the liver are typically hypovascular. With neuroendocrine tumors, they're often well-defined, hypervascular, and very brightly enhancing. They invade venous structures with that um, scalloping type appearance. They commonly will calcify. They can calcify centrally, diffuse, or very bulky. You can see enlarged lymph nodes, which are vascular, and METs to the liver are typically going to be hypervascular. Other considerations at times when you're looking surely at cystic neuroendocrine tumors, but also at hypervascular tumors, one challenge might be that renal cell carcinoma, when it metastasizes to the kidney, it can look just like a neuroendocrine tumor. But of course, the way I distinguish it is that you find the presence of a uh, absent kidney or partial nephrectomy. Most patients who get METs to the pancreas 
with partial nephrectomy or a nephrectomy, it occurs around 10 years post initial diagnosis. Serous cyst adenomas at times can be vascular, so it can be challenging. Intrapancreatic splenules, those lesions by the tail of the pancreas, can often simulate neuroendocrine tumors. And peripancreatic hypervascular lesions, like paragangliomas, also at times can be challenging. So it's never going to be the most easy differential diagnosis, though at times it may be easy to see the lesion. Now, in terms of doing the study right and detection, preancreatic protocol requires dual phase imaging. Then we can identify the lesion, characterize the lesion, determine extension to local vessels, as well as metastatic disease, and a properly done or properly done study um, is very helpful for surgical planning, particularly when we do 3D imaging. In terms of IV contrast, arterial and venous phase at 30 and 60 seconds works very nicely. And again, the arterial phase will typically show the vascular lesion, uh, while things like adenocarcinomas are going to be hypovascular. And again, the venous phase imaging, which is critical for staging. Most of the time, METs from neuroendocrine tumor to the liver are better seen arterial phase, but at times can be seen well venous phase as well. In terms of oral contrast, like any time we evaluate the pancreas, we want to give a neutral agent so it's easier to see the smaller tumors. And then post-processing requires multiplanar imaging, requires MIP imaging, volume rendering, and cinematic rendering. And we'll focus a lot on cinematic rendering. In terms of MIP imaging, anything that's very vascular, MIP is very helpful for. Now, in terms of cinematic rendering, um, we don't want to make this a talk on cinematic rendering, but it does create a very natural model. And when you compare uh, the vascularity of the pancreas and these tumors, it really makes them show very nicely. So I have found at times it's easy to pick up neuroendocrine tumors with cinematic rendering that you might miss with routine imaging if you're not very careful. So potential uses for cinematic, early detection to detect tumors when they're small, improved classifications of lesions. We are looking at using this information for grading lesions, be it one, two, or two, three, and potentially to predict outcomes. We use cinematic rendering for pre-surgical planning. We look at it for education, both for the surgeons as well as for the patients. Now, I don't want to go into staging all that much, but you can see T1 through T4 is size dependent. T1 typically is under 2 centimeters and T2, 2 to 4 cm. METs, liver, extrahepatic sites, uh, particularly uh, adenopathy. In terms of management, there is the question what to do with lesions when they're small, surely a centimeter, but also a number typically brought up as two centimeters. One of the things that we're trying to do with radiomics is determine whether things are one or grade two and three. Grade two and three are typically going to resect. One you'll commonly follow. With surgery, depending on how big the lesion is and where it is, surgery can range from parenchymal sparing with a nucleation, for example, or more extensive surgery like a Whipple's procedure distal pancreatectomy, or even at times, total pancreatectomy. Follow-up exams should include uh, appropriate physical exams, biochemical markers, and imaging such as CT. At times, dotatate nuke studies can be very, very helpful. So I have for you more than a dozen cases that illustrate what we're looking at. So let's take a look at some of them and then we'll do a part two and finish up. So this is the most typical hypervascular neuroendocrine tumor. Really nice example. The lesions are well-defined, well-circumscribed, avidly enhancing, hypervascular. If this wasn't a neuroendocrine tumor, yes, I would be thinking about a renal cell carcinoma, but again, the kidneys look fine. There's nothing. This is a neuroendocrine tumor, very classic. Here's the same lesion when you look at the uh, 
PET, well, the CT without the PET in this case, but if you look at this CT with cinematic, very nicely showing you the lesion. You can see it with a range of cinematic renderings. You can understand, therefore, that very small lesions can be brought out with cinematic rendering by looking for changes in the texture of the lesion, which is based on its vascularity. So a very nice example. Here's a larger tumor tail of pancreas, cystic and solid calcifications. You see it very nicely on the cinematic rendering. Um, you can see some of the neovascularity present. Here we're using a combination of cinematic rendering and CTA to distinguish the extent of tumor and really be helpful for preoperative planning. Another case, here's an atypical hypovascular neuroendocrine tumor. You can see this lesion looks more like an adenocarcinoma, looks like maybe an a, um, IPMN that went bad. But, you know, you can see it's really not as vascular as you typically like to think about. So, again, neuroendocrine tumors can be hypovascular. They do become more difficult to diagnose in that scenario. Um, neuroendocrine tumors can cause pancreatic duct dilatation, but less commonly than adenocarcinoma. And occasionally, these neuroendocrine tumors are more visible on the venous phase than on the arterial phase. Now, cinematic rendering, we've been showing how it really shows subtleties in textural change. So you very nicely can see here the cystic component of the lesion standing out against the normal texture. Now, one reason I could tell you it's a neuroendocrine and not an IPMN, you see the enhancing rim. With IPMNs, the lesions are well-defined and cystic, but you don't see that enhancing rim. And that may be subtle, but it's a very, very good finding. Here's another case. The patient has diffuse fatty infiltration of the pancreas. You see what's basically a five millimeter hypervascular lesion by the tail of pancreas, nicely shown on the cinematic as well. Uh, again, cinematic can be very helpful for picking up these small tumors. You also can see how easy it is to miss a small tumor. Another case. Here's an incidentally noted neuroendocrine tumor. You know, it's funny, in the old days, we, we would miss 90% of neuroendocrine tumors when they were small. Now the issue is we pick up many small lesions that are not clinically suspected. And so then the question is management, aggressive versus following. In this case, you can see a small tumor, tail of pancreas. It's not an it's not a, uh, accessory splenule. It's separate from the spleen, doesn't enhance the same way. Uh, also, the lesion is small, and this lesion was uh, followed and has continued to be followed. Now, we mentioned about splenules. Splenules typically enhance identical to the spleen. Uh, neuroendocrine tumors typically do not. The, it can be somewhat challenging, particularly when it's poking off the tail of the pancreas, when the more in the gland, it's easier to separate. And here's just some nice examples, same case, showing you a range of images with cinematic rendering, uh, accentuating the fatty gland and showing you the tumor very nicely. Another case, this patient had von Hippel-Lindau. As we mentioned, patients with syndromes, the lesions are small, but can be multiple. There's great satisfaction in picking up a lesion, and so often when you pick up one lesion, people will miss the second or third or fourth lesion. Here you can see two lesions in the head and one in the body. Neuroendocrine tumors are associated with syndromes such as von Hippel-Lindau, neurofibromatosis type 1, MEN type 1, and tuberous sclerosis. You should consider these possibilities when you pick up multiple neuroendocrine tumors. Sometimes the patient is not known to have one of these syndromes. And so when you see multiple neuroendocrine tumors, you better at least consider that possibility. And here's that same case again, very nicely showing you many of the lesions, showing you the appearance with cinematic rendering, very nicely done across a spectrum of images. Another case, this patient has a large neuroendocrine tumor involving most of the body and tail of the pancreas, 
very vascular encasement of arterial structure and multiple liver metastasis. The most common site of METs from neuroendocrine tumors is the liver and the typically hypervascular, which is nicely shown in this case. Occasionally, these lesions will be embolized if patients are very symptomatic, usually from hormonal excess. Other times, they'll simply be followed. They can be embolized also to debulk the patient prior to surgery. Here's the patient again, the extent of the neuroendocrine tumor metastasis into the liver. I do find at times that we see more lesions on the cinematic and on the MIP than we do on the routine imaging. And cinematic can be used for vascular excesses, assessment for involvement and for pre-surgical planning and treatment. The image on the right demonstrates splenic vein occlusion as well with resulting collateral. So again, very nice projection from below. Here's case number eight. Here's a patient with neuroendocrine tumor with metastasis, vascular involvement. The tumor is growing into the lymph nodes. It's growing to the retroperitoneum, the spleen, the portal vein, the splenic vein, and SMV, and you very nicely see the multiple vascular metastasis. So that's a range of lesions. Here's that same case, I'll show you one more image, very nicely defining the cinematic rendering, the neovascularity, the tumor, the extensive vascular extension by the splenic vein, portal vein, and SMV, very nicely shown, particularly on the image on your right. So that's a lot of information. I think we'll do is we'll stop there We'll come back, pick it up, and do some more cases. I hope you have a great day. Bye, guys. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.